um, to have uh, uh, Brandon Margolis and Brandon Sonia, uh, the showrunners uh, and creators of uh, LA's Finest uh, with me today. Um, we're really excited um, because uh, as you can see here, um, the premiere is coming up uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, about nine days from today on, uh, on AXN. Um, at, uh, at uh, 10 o'clock uh, throughout um, uh, the region. Uh, this will be uh, season two of, um, of, of LA's Finest. And um, you know, just to sort of very, very quickly catch you guys up um, on, uh, on what happened uh, last year, the last time that we saw um, Sid, she had been uh, seen taking down a, a drug ring uh, here in her, uh, her original hometown of, uh, yeah. of Miami. Um, and um, uh, she was still obviously paired with uh, McKenna, her, uh, her partner, who's played by, by Jessica Alba. I should have mentioned, of course, that, um, that Sid is played uh, by Gabrielle Union. Um, and uh, these guys are, are very much rooted in, our, in, the, in the bad boys, um, uh, for, you know, the bad boys culture, if you will, in the bad boys uh, ecosystem. Um, and uh, uh, Brandon and uh, uh, Sonia and uh, Margolis um, have been working together as a, a producing and writing uh, team for, for several years, um, including um, with um, our other big um, hit from, uh, from Sony Pictures on uh, Sony Pictures Television on, on, uh, on the AXN, which is, of course, the blacklist um, for several years now. Uh, as well as uh, they paired together on um, on the verge, uh, the show on the verge, um, and uh, it's a real pleasure to have you guys here and uh, and, and welcome. Thank you for having Thanks us. For having us. Um, you know, we were before we were talking about actually after we were talking about fantasy football and, and the <laughs> challenges of of uh, you know dealing with you know elementary school kids and in, in, a, in a virtual. Uh, classroom um, setting, um, you know, to like instead of driving, diving straight into challenges, I thought I'd start with something easier. Like, how did how did this show come about? What what gave you guys the idea um, to to create um, Sid and, and and McKenna? Well, you know, Sid was created for us. Sid comes straight from the the story of Bad Boys Two. She is Marcus Burnett's little sister and uh you know in bad boys 2 we saw her as this kick-ass dea agent and then the the idea to bring that character kind of back and 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 check in with her actually came from gabrielle union who plays the role so gab said you know why don't we see what's going on with sid and 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 what sid's life is like now and and so you know margolis and i ended up kind of looking at that and saying, yeah, if we were gonna you know, play in the bad boy sandbox, we'd wanna do something similar to, to the movies that inspired us to those bad boys films where it was two opposites brought together at, by their love of protecting people and, and enforcing the law and family. You know, We looked at those movies as family movies. So we said, all right, well, we have Sid Burnett, let's give her her family, let's move her to Los Angeles and make something new and distinct for her. And, and so the story kind of was built from there. Um, how, how what, I mean, with obviously with Sid, like you said, you know, there, there's already a lot of backstory there for her. So I imagine it's easier to bring her to life. What kinds of, you know, how, how do you bring somebody like McKenna uh, to life and, um, and, and pair her with somebody that you, you, you already know a lot about? Well, you know, much like the films, the, the partnership uh, between these two cops, they kind of fill in the voids in each other's lives. You know, in the films, you had The Bachelor and The Family Man. So when we sat down with Gabrielle and talked about how we saw the character of Sid, we saw her as this sort of, you know, unapologetically single woman living her life um, to the utmost and, and pursuing the things that, that she was passionate about not just in her job, but in her personal life. So when we had that touchstone to start with, we said, okay, well, what is the best pairing to put Sid with that could give a lot of ground for comedy and, and to have sort of those stresses in life when you're partnered with somebody who comes at things from a slightly opposite point of view. So we knew we wanted McKenna 
to be sort of more rooted in a traditional family, you know, with a husband and a child and sort of, you know, taking the kid to school on her way to work type of lifestyle and juxtapose that with somebody who, you know, would go out and have a, a wild night and then make it to work on time the next morning and sort of looking at bringing those opposite points of view into their combined, um, you know, work life would, would sort of fed us a lot of ideas about where the show could go. That, that sort of, that, sort of um, that contrast or those differences in perspective is, is there, there are, you mentioned the humor in the show, is a lot of that grounded in those sort of different perspectives that they approach the same issues with? Definitely. And that, you know, that's a big part of, of how Brandon and I work. And, and it's part of what sort of made us respond to the films so much is that, you know, you've got, you know, you're a partnership with somebody who brings their baggage, whatever, what good or bad to, to work every day. And, you know, in order to get through it, you have to have a sense of humor. You know, you can't let things build up or, or, you know, um, undermine what you are setting out to do as a team. Um, so it's just, it's, there's a natural, uh, you know, banter that can happen between two characters in tense situations. And the best way to diffuse that tension is with humor. Um, and it's one of the elements of the movies that we loved. And it's what we try to replicate on the show. Now, um, I, I think that most of the production on this season was done by the time sort of production shut down. Is that, is that fair? We, yeah, um, we, we finished right on time. We, we, we finished, I think, a week. We, we had our wrap party the weekend before everything kind of shut down. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like thinking ahead to the, to, to the next season um, and, and those beyond, if we're sort of still in, in this, in, in the, at least a hybrid place in between being able to be on set, but particularly in the writer's room, how do you guys create that dialogue and that snap and that, and that fun uh, I mean, you know, the two of you, I'm sure, can, can, can probably get together, but it's harder to do it with a, with a bigger writing team. Can you talk about some of those challenges and, and what that's like? Or, or would you anticipate that that might be, might be like? Yeah, I mean, you know, looking forward to how, how things are going to have to work from now on, uh, everything's going to be a little bit different. But, there, you know, there is a way, there is a path to success. Right now, we are on a Zoom. We, you know, whereas we may have done this in the same room in the past, we can do this via Zoom the same way we can do a, a writer's, a virtual writer's room. I have friends now that are running their virtual writer's rooms. And, you know, it is a little bit different. You don't get that same in the room kind of back and forth, but you, you figure it out. And in some ways, I have friends who say it's been better creatively to do an hour and a half of really focused writer's room work and then step away and have time to think about it and say, well, it would be funnier if we did this here and it would, you know, the drama would be heightened if we moved that there and the way the ebb and flow of their day has gotten even better. Um, how, how do you guys sort of keep it real, keep it authentic, um, even previously, right? Um, in, in terms of like the kind of dialogue that, that, a couple of cops would have with one another or that a single, you know, that a single woman and a married woman are going to have with one another. And, and the sort of obviously the drama and the, and the action, you know, that they're in, how, how do you, how, how do you keep that authentic? Uh, the, the answer to that is to hire writers who are better than us. <laughs> um, we, you know, no, it's, it's to hire a diverse staff of writers who may have experienced the things that we're going to be writing about, you know, on our staff, uh, we have a majority of people of color. We have a majority of women. Um, you know, we, we do have an uh, ex-cop. We, we, you know, we do consult with the police on any, anything that might be questionable, anything where it's like, well, how would this really work? Um, so we want that authenticity, but we want authenticity both in the police work and in the lived experiences of, of these women's everyday lives. And I would also add that, you know, we collaborate with our cast very well. I think um, Gabrielle and Jessica are both very thoughtful about the characters and really want them to be authentic women living their truest selves and to be cool and to be funny and to be all that fun, uh, LA's finest energy. And so they, they bring, they're very thoughtful about the dialogue. We'll have conversations and rehearsals. It sounds weird, wouldn't I? I feel like Sid might say it this way. And we are very open to them being comfortable with the words coming out of their mouths because they're the ones 
who are saying it on screen. So it's important for us to trust them when they feel like the, the dialogue isn't exactly the way they would say it, and they trust us to tell stories and make dramatic choices that are, that are interesting and authentic, and it really is all about trusting and collaborating with your partners. Isn't that like, um, you know, I, I mean, as, as a younger screenwriter or, or writer for television, did you imagine that it would be such a collaborative process with your artists and with your actors, or were you thinking, I've got a vision for my story and this is the way that I want to tell it. I think the, the one of the best lessons I learned um, going from being a writer, you know, a lower level writer on the blacklist to, to running a show is that you, you, as a writer, you have to learn the difference between the things that the story needs and the things that you want. So if it's something that you don't, the story doesn't necessarily need, but you want it and other people have objections to it. Those are the types of things that you need to take a step back and realize, well, maybe the thing I'm fascinated by isn't registering with other people and being willing to let some of those things go or to let people change them and, and bring their um, point of view to, to the forefront, as opposed to the things that you know, you have to learn that you know the story needs these plot beats to, to make sense or these emotional um, you know, revelations that need to happen for the character to track. But you can't get so caught up in, in everything on the page being exactly perfect because a lot of times you know other people aren't hearing it the same way as you intended and you have to be willing to be flexible and i was lucky enough to have a previous career almost as a, an independent director right you know I, I made some independent films before i transitioned into tv and you know having worked as a director my first film i wrote I produced and then we're putting it together and I realized, oh man, I didn't write like people, but the people talk like people. So why don't we just let them talk? Uh, and, and so, you know, being on set and listening to the actors and, and working the scenes beforehand, you really get a sound for each person's voice as the character. And you learn when you sit down to write, oh, that's right. People are going to say this. So now that I've, now that I've written down what I, think I want to say, let's think about how I want it to be said. And then it goes through the process of other writers taking a look and your cast and crew giving their notes. And then on set, you realize, oh, it sounds better like this. Or, you know, like my partner said, they say, I really think it would, you know, I would say it like that. And you, you go through that process all the way till the end. Um, you know, a few minutes ago, we were, uh, I, I, and I'm sorry if I sort of went away from the, the, the topic. We were talking a little bit about, you know, uh, keeping it real and, and, and the authentic um, sort of nature of, of both their relationship. Obviously, with everything that's going on today, you know, here in the States, in terms of our, our society and our culture and our relationship to police and the community's relationship to policing, how does, you know, what, what kind of a model are you guys looking for to... To, to bring to that relationship and, and to contribute to that to that conversation? Well, you know, look, there's there are obvious problems with policing in the United States, you know, and I, you can't say at the moment, they've always been there. Uh, people, uh, and you know, risk of oversharing, people are often like, did you know? And it's like, hey guys, I've been black the whole time. So yeah, I knew, uh, but look, that's the thing. I've been black the whole time. Gab's been black the whole time. Jessica has been Latina the, the whole time. And so from the beginning, we have made a conscious effort to put images on screen that, that we feel represent the truth of the situation and our truth as people of color who want to see something different, who want to see the, the police who do care for the community and not just you know the thing that we see all the time the overzealous police who just wants the arrest or the people of color as the bad guys you know the the images that are out there are dangerous they you know they are and we are seeing that in the streets we're seeing that on the news every night uh and so we really feel it's our responsibility to be extremely careful about the images that we we put out there and to try and uplift but to to also try and be truthful and 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 represent what is really happening and also you know i think 
the the police genre is something that's been you know exciting to audiences in movies and TV shows for a long time. And we don't believe it's going away, but we do need to, as, a, as an industry, take a hard look at the way we are representing police. And not just, like my partner was saying, the, the actions that they take, but also literally just in representation. If you go back and look at some of the most famous cop shows on TV, it's almost to a T, it's a white male lead or a couple of white dudes, you know, chasing down bad guys. And that's sort of the, the, the cowboy image that we're used to and that we continue to put out product like that. But a show like LA's Finest allows us to just change the image of how you think of cops on TV a little bit. They're two women of color. You know, it's still the same action. It's still the same fun banter. Um, but it, it shows that there are a number of ways to tell those stories and through different points of view. And it can be just as successful and just as much fun. I mean, you guys out in front, right? I mean, you know, how many cop shows are, have there been um, with, with two women of color as the, as the leads, right? I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm older than you guys both, and I remember, like, Cagney and Lacey was, like, a big deal, and, you know, and it was two white women, right? right. So, you know, and that was 30 years ago, maybe? Yeah. No, look, I think a lot of that, too, we owe credit to, to the film franchise that we are spinning off of, because, you know, when Jerry Bruckheimer put out this cop movie, with Martin and Will back in the 90s, that was not the normal way that you sell a cop movie. You know, like there, you had your interracial couples like in Lethal Weapon, but to put two black men at the forefront, and at the time they were not Will Smith and Martin Lawrence, they were TV yeah. actors. And what was so interesting and so successful about those movies is how fun and different it was. And it, it was just as exciting as any other cop movie you've seen. But part of what made the Bad Boys movie so unique is that it was two diverse guys. And, you know, as a white dude from Connecticut who saw that movie, I thought it was awesome. And they, you know, it didn't, it launched that franchise, but not every, you know, movie has taken that kind of a risk. Um, so for us to, to be the first show to do two women of color as the leads in a cop show, it makes sense that it's of the bad boys universe because they've always been taking those chances. That's great. Um, you mentioned uh, uh, Jerry Bruckheimer, um, who I, I just found out it was from, is from Detroit, which is, you know, like amazing in itself, right? Because you think of a guy like that as sort of, you know, fully formed in Hollywood, right? You know, I mean, <laughs> he's, he's, he's absolutely an, uh, an icon. What's it like to to work with him and uh, and, and 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 you know see like and try to hit those highs and from an action standpoint, from a, a pace standpoint? I mean, you you said it. Jerry Bruckheimer is an icon, and you know it, it's. I don't think it's really until you work with him that you re, you realize that he earned it. Like that, Jerry Bruckheimer is maybe the best producer in the history of Hollywood. He is there for you no matter what you need, when you need it to fully support the creative process, but also to kind of be a voice that says, look, I'm Jerry Bruckheimer and I know what works. So try this or hey, that's not working, try it this way. You know, we did, that's one of my favorite stories about Jerry. We did our first cut of the show and, and it was our first time having Jerry come in and watch the cut with us when we made the pilot and he came in and you know I watched him sit down and he said okay let's start and I kind of looked around like you know he's not going to take notes like he's just going to watch the thing and he he did he, he we ran it from beginning to end he wanted to see the the show from beginning to end and we ran it and then he stopped and he said it's very good it's very good now let's start over and we started from the beginning and he literally said to the to the editor okay stop and would give a note at whatever time code it was, he had done the entire thing by memory. Here, I need this to happen and that to happen. And I'm confused about this story point because if you move something from later here, we'll understand. And now go, okay, stop. Like the entire note session was done from memory and every note was spot on and perfect. I had never seen anything like it. That's and, great. Yeah, and to, just to echo my partner's point, one of the greatest things about Jerry is that he empowers people. Um, but there is a high standard. You need to, you can't, you know, they're not going to suffer fools. And it's not just Jerry, it's his team. Um, Christian Reed, Jonathan Littman, James O and Omega Johnson, they are all the Jerry Bruckheimer TV team that we work with. And they produce this show with us. They have been there since the pilot. 
and all of them are very, they remind you that there is a standard that they will, and short of that, they will not accept. But when you are, when they recognize how hard you're working and that when something works, they will defend the, the work, whether it's the studio or the network or any, any objection that could come in, they will defend the creative as long as they understand where you're coming from. So they, they, they're a really, really great group of people to work with. I, you know, I don't know if, if um, probably because he's been around so long, but um, um, Alessia, who, who you guys met earlier, who joined us on the call, uh, last year, well, about 18 months ago, actually, we had a chance to go see a, a, a little snippet of, of uh, Bad Boys for Life when they were filming here in, uh, in Miami. And it was the wedding scene, right? Uh, at the uh, at the end of the film, and and um, and and Bruckheimer, you know, is there playing a, a role, and he like it was two takes, and that was it. I mean, you know, <laughs> they, ran, they ran through one and then the other, and he was, you know, it, it was it was it was really great. Yeah. I mean, you know, so like even in front of the camera, he was he was spot yeah, on. He just nails it. He's spot on every time. Right. Uh, how how much of a uh, you know it was also fascinating to me. Like he says, like. You know, he really gives everybody a lot of room to um, to work with, uh, and I remember sort of being struck by the fact that um, there was two directors on, um, on on Bad Boys for Life three. Is that an example of that kind of of runway that 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 you guys get to to have? Well, you know those those guys um, they are they're a directing team um, that they did a small film like this. This is the thing about Jerry is when he sees something great he will he will take it and and run with it and and try to make it its fullest potential so these guys had done this you know this foreign film they, they hadn't really done any big american films yet and jerry saw the film and doug belgrad one of the other producers you know saw the film and and, and reached out to the guys and they pitched their take on the bad boys franchise and you know boom, there you go. They're making a bad boys movie. It was, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing that happens in, in kind of the orbit of Jerry Bruckheimer. When he sees something fantastic, he says, great, go do that. Right. That's fantastic. Um, you know, in, in, in bad boys, obviously Miami is, is sort of the backdrop. I understand this season, you guys spent a lot of time in, in the Koreatown neighborhood uh, of LA. Um, for folks that haven't had a chance to to explore it um, or, or had a, a lot of chance to get to LA, can you tell us a little bit about like what that's like, some of the challenges that were involved, um, and 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 sort of you know what kind of of of, of sense of place that 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 Koreatown brings to to this season? Yeah, you know, um, creatively, Koreatown mm -hmm. is a really it's an amazing place because it is a true melting pot of cultures. Um, you know, when we were looking at different pockets of LA that we wanted to feature in season two, Koreatown was one of the first ones we looked at. And in doing our research, we realized that even though it's called Koreatown, the Korean population is not the majority by demographic any, any longer. So it just shows that the neighborhood is, is full of culture and, and different folks living together. Um, so it was an exciting place because we do love to feature the city of Los Angeles in our show. Um, but not just the things that you've come to expect from Hollywood, like the Hollywood sign or, you know, Sunset Boulevard, but like the pockets of the city that don't get the same amount of exposure um, in film and TV. So we really loved getting to go to a place like Koreatown and shooting it Koreatown for Koreatown. There were, it, there was, it was amazing to go there. Anywhere you set up the camera, there was a really interesting shot. There were so many cool buildings and structures and graffiti and artwork and all this cool stuff. I, I, and I will add that the people of Koreatown were incredibly inviting and, and really, um, you know, embraced the fact that we were showing Koreatown for Koreatown. We, we shot, I can't remember the name of the rec center where we shot, but, you know, we, we used an actual rec center to double as a rec center that was being built by a character on the show. And the, you know, instead of making things difficult and saying, you can only do this hour or this hour, the people there said, great. Also, we have a film class. Can we bring our film class to, to set? And it became this great kind of learning lesson for a, a bunch of students from their rec center to watch an actual, you know, big Hollywood production 
being made. And, and that kind of, of um, help from the community really made a difference. You know, it really made this season feel authentic and, and feel like we were really in the city of Los Angeles and, and living through the people. So, frozen. did we lose Alfredo? I think we did. Well, Brandon, would you like to tell us anything else about yourself? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we lost him. Let me see. I, I'm going to ask one question. Um, yeah. Talk about your journey from the Blacklist to Ellie's Finest. Sure. Um, so Brandon and I were fortunate to get um, staffed as the staff writers on the first season of the Blacklist. Um, and we were there for five seasons uh, before uh, leaving to do LA's Finest. And it was such an incredible experience to be on a show that really was the, you know, number one with a bullet on the network that year. Um, it was a smash hit for NBC and for Sony. Um, so it, it was amazing to be part of a culture that was um, just learning on the job of a, what a successful show looks like. Um, and seeing how the showrunners, the creator, John Bokenkamp, and the showrunner, John Eisendrath, you know, brought in a, a big staff. And so we got to work with so many different writers and learn from so many different people's experiences. It was the most incredible um, education you could, you could want as a, as a writing, young writing team. And to be brought back for five seasons um, is, is a very, you know, we recognize that that's not a very common practice for a lot of writers to get to be on a show that survives one season, let alone five, and to get to come back um, every year was such a blessing. And, um, you know, so that was a, a, an amazing experience to be on that show. Um, I, I'm guessing somebody asked the question about your journey. <laughs> yeah, it was me. <laughs> it was <laughs> seamless. <laughs> Excellent save. We've got a, we've got a, we've got a good team here as well. Absolutely. Um, you know, the, uh, can you talk a little bit, uh, one of the things that I like uh, about the blacklist um, is that, you know, there's a, there's a really dry and, and sly, you know, sort of sense of, uh, of humor in it. And I, and I know, uh, Brandon Margolis, you've spent some time, um, you know, working with the office, um, you know, in, in your earlier uh, career. You know, how, how do you, you know, do, does having that sort of comedy experience or that experience with humor um, help or, or, or do you find it sometimes like you've got to set it aside because this is a, 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 it's a, it's a different show and it's a different kind of a character that you're trying to you know, develop? Well, specifically for LA's Finest, you know, we do try to, to be of that same bad boys energy, which was action and humor and in the, in the form of, you know, banter between the characters and relieving tension with, with some comedy. My early experiences on those comedy shows, I used to work for um, the director, Paul Feig, who uh, directed Bridesmaids and Ghostbusters. And, but before he, he blew up in features, he was doing some of the best comedy on television. And that's when I worked with him. So we worked on, you know, I got to go to set with him when he would direct uh, an episode of 30 Rock or when he was on The Office as a co-EP for a whole season. So I got to, it was the best job for a young aspiring writer to have because I got to stand by Paul's side and watch everybody at The Office do some of the greatest comedy that's ever been on TV. Um, and just absorb how they worked and, and the way that the cast would riff with the writers. And one of the things I, without realizing it, became prepared to do was that, you know, we're not a, we're not a traditional comedy show, but we do try to put jokes in there every once in a while. And a lot of times uh, they're always looking for alts. Like if a joke doesn't land or you read it in rehearsal and everyone's kind of like, that wasn't very funny. It's like, all right, well, let's think of something better. But like now, because there's like a lot of people here with lights and cameras. so say something funny and it's it's can be paralyzing if you don't have some alts in mind and I can remember on the pilot episode uh, there's a scene where Jessica is calling the Benz uh, a funny name and it was not the name that ended up on camera was not the one that was written that day and Jessica and I don't know if it was just because we had just started working together decided to test us and was like hey give me a bunch of different versions of names that I can call these guys and I was like like right now. <laughs> so she would say one and then 
it would get a laugh and then I'd go up and get, write one down and show it to her and she'd crack up. And so we did a bunch of different versions that way. And some of them were funny, some of them weren't. Um, the one that ended up on screen is was the best one. But it, it is, you know, I do credit uh, some of that time that I spent with Paul learning how comedians think and work and just always being ready. If you're going to write a joke, have a few backups in mind because it's shit's not as funny when you say it the first time you got to move on. Right. Well, I've, I've been told I only have time for one more question. I was, I was going to ask you and I promise next time Brandon Sarnier, I'll ask you about like what you prefer more like producing or directing oh, wow. or, or writing. But you know, since, since in our prep, we had talked a little bit about, um, uh, the heat, um, you know, <laughs> so many people here on the call are, are in Miami or at least from kind of close to Miami. We're all wondering, will Mr. Gabrielle Union ever make a, a cameo uh, appearance on the show? I love that you just called him Mr. Gabrielle Union. <laughs> uh, look, uh, does Dwayne come hang out on set? Yes. He, okay. he supports his, his wife. He'll, he'll bring Kav, their daughter. Like it's the, uh, we have a true family vibe on set and, and the families are there, including him. Is he going to step in front of the camera? I don't know. We, I, we'll have to, you have to tune in to see, I guess. We, which, we, which is a great way to end because we're, the show's premiering here on, uh, <laughs> on AXN, uh, September 16th. Guys, it has been like a total pleasure. I really, really enjoy meeting you both. And thank you so much for sharing your thoughts about the, about the season uh, uh, coming up and as well as, you know, how you sort of got here. And, uh, and I, I hope we can do it again. Yeah, uh, maybe really, like in a different format, for season three. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Thank you for supporting the show. Um, it's truly our pleasure to get to talk about the show and and ourselves. Um, but to get to talk to wonderful people and and uh, really we uh, just are grateful that people are enjoying the show and and hope that we can continue writing a show that people love. That's fantastic. Thanks very much. And thank you all for, uh, for joining us today. It's been, uh, it's been a pleasure having you all. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Bye now. Bye-bye.